When you hear that, you hear that, you know what's around the corner. It's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah. I love music, but I especially love the music of movies. And today on the Rule Thirds Podcast, we're going to be talking about the people who make the greatest film music out there. With that in mind, my name is Max. And my name is Larry. Larry, we are free from the clutches of Sean Captaville. Let us go and gush about our favorite film composers. Let us be free! So, my friend Larry, how are you doing on this fine day? Uh, I'm pretty good. Like, the last few days have been very stress-free. Um, really? I honestly don't, like, Sunday my plans all got screwed over, so I literally just sat down and watched both Ace Ventura movies back-to-back. And like, That's I, cool. Yeah, like, I haven't had the time to do a movie double feature in months. Like, I have it, it never just felt done good. That. Just felt good, man. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, nice. you, it'd be, you're, it's interesting when you look at it because when you watch both of those movies, they fit together perfectly. Like, it's yeah. literally one uh, after was, the yeah. other. Yeah, I, I just, I actually had that feeling. I just got off of spring break um, last week. It was, it was so good. I listened to audiobooks, walked around my town, and did nothing. It was wonderful. And now I'm back at school where I can't do any of that. That's always nice to have one or two days where you just do nothing. And then, and then yes, you know, a, relax, a relaxing period. Then you just get back to having a schedule. You know, it's mm-hmm. nice. But, uh, yeah, it's that, that's good. So, Larry, before we get into the, today's wonderful topic, what is the community saying about our incredibly worldwide popular podcast? Uh, yes, uh, worldwide. We hit everywhere. We hit, uh, and we have especially, a, a, oddly enough, very popular in Bangladesh. Did you know this? R- really? Really? Bangladesh? Well, yeah. shout out to the Bangladeshians. That's probably crazy. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Sean cannot be with us today because Sean is going through quite a hefty amount of schoolwork and uh, just, you know, being busy. So uh, we wish Sean the best of luck in getting all that done. And he will be back next week for a very interesting topic, uh, which we will not share because it'll be a nice surprise. Uh, but it does work with our last episode. Keep in mind. Uh, I So that leaves me in charge of the community segment. Uh, and the last episode we posted um, on YouTube anyway – uh, was the Oscar bait edition episode. We also have the special debate between Max and Sean, Big Hero 6 versus How to Train Your Dragon 2 uh. on iTunes. Uh, okay, real talk, that was, that was not my finest moment, okay? It, it really like, was I was in spring break mode. I was just not and, caring and you know what, what Sean here's was what's, Here's what's the worst thing. You are so laid back in that. But when I post my status about How to Train Your Dragon 2, <laughs> that's when you decide to get combative. You're like, ugh, God. Yeah, I know, I... Because, whatever, whatever. We'll, okay. we'll do another debate someday, and right. it will be better. I swear, I will do a better job. Anyway, Larry, what is the community saying? we got to get going. Yeah, so, the comments on the Oscar bait edition. Uh, first of all, it is Unasis, not Unasis. I apologize, Seth. Uh, his username is Unasis. 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 Or Unasis, I guess. I don't know. Whatever. It's weird. I, I want to know where that came from. Please let us know. Uh, Braxton Hudson, friend of Sean, goes, Sean, 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 what's the weather like? In your neck of the woods. That is either a reference to Max saying it a few episodes ago and Sean getting mad, or it's an inside joke. Either way, well done. (laughs) Um, And then the one and only. And then, of course. The one and only. The one and only Captain Raccoon Whitley. By the way, Braxton, Seth, keep commenting. We're we're growing. Um, So Whitley really responded to our idea and gave us his own film idea that he really wanted to do. What? I, that was a sound I was trying to make of, of, of a word that you say when, like, somebody says something awesome. You go, dang! And I did and I did not sound good. Okay, so his idea is uh, the movie's called The Mamzer, uh, directed by Steven Spielberg, written by John Ridley. Hmm. Oh, the man who wrote uh, 12 Years Slave. Yes, uh, he's, he's working off of us. Uh, cinematographer Roger Deakins, brilliant guy. Uh, Skyfall for those of you and uh, Prisoners for those of you who don't know fantastic cinematographer Uh, musical score done by John Williams and uh, the genre is historical drama and uh, slash fiction so historic fiction Uh, it stars Julianne Moore Steve Carell Miles Teller Shailene Woodley Daniel Radcliffe and Daniel Day-Lewis the synopsis is a troubled youth stumbles onto the path to his Jewish roots thanks in part to the help of a yeshiva student with a checkered past 
But when said youth realizes his mother, his mother, um, Mar I assume that's marital. It's this Marshall, but like it, it's it looks like it must have been a typo. Marshall infidelity, a secret that challenges his birthright. His entire quest is thrown into question. I, What's I am it called? The Mamzer. I don't know why the Mamzer, but I would. I it would reminds so me down. of the. Uh, it reminds me of the book called The Chosen, which I, uh, which is also about about how Siddiq uses it. Anyway, that sounds that sounds cool. I think Spielberg is a little bit too easy, though. I uh, think I, I think it's a little, I think the Academy is sort of over him, even though he's wonderful. Honestly, I think Steve McQueen. I I could totally see uh, Steve McQueen and John Ridley working on that project up again? together. Yeah, I would so be yeah. down for that. Uh, the and release I'm down date. Uh, just one very quickly. The release date is October of 2025. So October a is a great month for Oscar stuff. Yeah, that's absolutely. true. And uh, props to Daniel Radcliffe. I think honestly, he, he's got the charisma of a champion. So I think he. Yeah. So um, thank you for guys for those. Um, yes. This week's question, if you couldn't tell already, is who is your favorite composer and what is your favorite piece from them? Film you composers, what, people. Film composers. And if you're wondering what I can't think. Who is my favorite composer? Don't worry. We're going to go through a bunch of them real quick, and you're going to be reminded of all of them. So, Larry, I want to ask you something real quick. What makes, like, what is, like, the best part of a great film score? What, what makes a film score great? It's really the melodies, in my yep. opinion. It's, it's, what's important is that, think about film music, is that, I mean, it's really easy to appreciate somebody who does great ambience music. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, that is what film score has to be. A lot of the times it just has to be background music. You're not the focus. Yeah. The actors are. So you just have to give them sort of a nice springboard uh, to work with the camera work and things like that. But I think really the most memorable and recognizable film scores and, or, or film songs of all time come from the, just the brilliant, playful melodies uh, that, that come yeah. from them. And you'll see you'll see why my theory stands after we go through some of these uh, mm -hmm. some of these uh, examples we have. And what I love about the film co composer like community, I guess, is that I don't really see any bad ones. I just see ones that don't really stand out. Like the like the great ones stand out, and then the other ones are like, eh, whatever. So it, I mean, they're, they're, they're all talented. Negative. Like you know, they all have talent. Yeah, <laughs> they all have. To, yeah, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like set in stone. Like you have to be able to do it and do it well. And have people like enjoy your music in order to get somewhere. So it's gonna be a very positive and very good podcast. And so where should we where where should we start, Larry? Where should we start? Who's the first composer that we should talk about? Well, I mean, okay, so we're dealing with a lot of memorable film composers. Composers of creative song created songs that we all remember. Or at least, you know, me and Max remember specifically. And I think one of the first ones we should talk about is the one who pretty much is is, you know, was the composer behind one of the most highly revered films of all time, which is Citizen Kane, and um... Ah, oh, dang it. Ha... Mm, his name is Bernard Herman. Bernard Herman. I know, I learned of his score. I really like his work in Citizen Kane, as well as in Psycho. Did a great job there. He, yeah. Just if, if you don't know, he's the composer behind that theme from Psycho. You know the one. You know the one. In fact, let's play a clip! You know, we don't. That's it. That's all you need to hear. You you know what it is. It's just the, those yeah. violins. Yeah. Just eh, 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 eh. you know, just it, it's exactly. it, it's a staple. It's a staple. Yeah. Bernard Herrmann is like I don't know I don't know how to pronounce his name. Bernard Herrmann Herman I don't know. Herman. He's like from what from where I stand, he's like the first famous film composer, and he's not only just known for Citizen Kane and Psycho. He he also composed the music for Taxi Driver, you know, directed by the one and only Martin Scorsese and uh, Robert De Niro, and that's probably my favorite piece from him. It's nice. Kind of jazzy, very, very much um, reflective of the city of which the movie takes place, and he's just—he knows that he like he was. I don't want to say the name of the person I'm about to say the name of because we're going to talk about it later, but he was the big star, all-star composer of his time, and it's just you know I think it's a good place to start with him because he's really like he did so much, he did so so much. What I love about his work, especially, is that he really made a lot of strong connections with several different people. Uh, he made yeah. connections with Orson Welles. For uh, that, he for you know Citizen Kane. He also did a lot of work for Hitchcock. I mean, we mentioned Psycho, but he also did North by Northwest and Vertigo, two other great oh, scores. Yeah. Uh, and it's just he was sort of he sort of I I want to say he essentially paved the way. I mean his yeah his huge his big melodies and his creative different ways of you know making 
each of his movies sound different. He essentially was... He was, like, that composer. You know, we, we can name, like, some people like Hans Zimmer, which we'll get to later. Don't worry. We'll get to him. Uh, we can mention people like that, you know, off the top of our heads. People back then probably knew this guy because who doesn't remember movies like Psycho, Vertigo, Taxi Driver, some of the most classic movies of all time. It's true. Um, he, he really is, like, again, he's, like, the first. My father actually was, like, taught me about him and, like, this, this guy is awesome. But uh, moving on, I think our next one should probably be one that, uh, just to give our co-host who's not here a little bit of uh, attention, uh, Vangelis. That is not the name of the guy, but it certainly is, like, his nickname and i think his most i think his most famous score is the one for blade runner which is a great great score what chariots of fire uh, all right that's yeah that's big too i guess i just my exposure to him was like listening to the blade runner soundtrack back in freshman year of high school and i was like dang this is awesome yeah like, this is like good. synthesizer maximum awesomeness yeah you know not many composers really um kind of revel in the power of electronic uh, sounds in their in their score. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I would understand why they wouldn't. It's sort of electronic sounds just sound a little too synthy and a little too you know buzzy for like real world ambience. But what yeah, people but as do Vangelis do. Vangelis has it, shown us, right? Yeah, exactly. You can totally make it work. And we've seen quite a few examples. We'll get to one, but I also would like to point out mm-hmm. Daft Punk, Tron, Legacy. I oh, think that yeah, soundtrack yeah, is Daft great. Punk, making the best and only good part of that movie. Yes, I would love to see them come <laughs> back because. Yeah, they, they totally understood the like the marriage of both synthesizer and orchestra. Like oh, yeah. when they came in at the same time it was like, mm, that's that's beautiful. We're talking about like this is the kind of music that like sends chills all over not only down your spine, psh, it goes all over your body. It's all like over the makes body. you feel incredible. Just all over the body. Yeah. <laughs> don't place. don't, Every don't place. misconstrue that. Don't don't you misconstrue that. Um, <laughs> all right, who who's next, Larry? Pick a composer. Just throw one, right. throw one out there. So let's let's we'll throw it an easy one, Max. We'll we'll give them one that they all know. Let's talk a little bit about Danny Elfman. Uh, right. the one and only Danny. Danny Elfman. Elfman, the the creepy, spooky man behind several of Tim Burton's greatest films: uh, Edward Scissorhands, uh, Beetlejuice, um, Batman. Uh, and big a, fish, if a big fish, big fish, right? big fish, correct. Yeah. But I mean, not only that though, he has done several other works uh, for other franchises. Specifically, one that's very, that's one that's close to your heart, I'm sure, Spider Man. Yeah, is yes, that, which is one guy. of the most fitting and yet also not fitting themes for a superhero ever. Like it doesn't really sound like Spider Man, but it sounds like Spider Man. You know, I, I think the guy really understands like the kind of emotional wavelength that goes into the darker tones of how like music is structured. It's like. You know, and again, it's very quirky, very kind of like, you know, kind of childlike, innocent kind of dark. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Also, the theme, he's done themes for shows that you all definitely know. The Simpsons, responsible yep. for that theme. Desperate Housewives, responsible for that theme as well. Um, and he also did Pee Wee, another movie that I personally am very close to my heart, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which is another Tim Burton film. But, I mean, yeah. he, one more thing I'd like to mention. He was Jack Skellington in The Nightmare Before Christmas. His voice. That's right. And I think he is not, he is one of the only composers I know about who can sing, you know, very well, you know, and add that to his, to his work. I mean, The Nightmare Before Christmas, the score for that film is just absolutely incredible. The the music is some of the most memorable of any children's, quote unquote, uh, musicals I've ever seen. Absolutely. So I love the guy. He's great. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to throw out a composer. Now, this one's a little bit less known, but I think he's, like, I, I he's one of the few composers I kind of have an, have one issue with, but, like, he's still really good. I'm talking about Thomas Newman. Do you know, like, what, tell me about it. Larry, you know Thomas Newman? I've, I've heard his name thrown around. Yeah, Thomas Newman is kind of the composer that he's, he sticks very much to his own themes, or his own, like, his own style, to the point where it's a bit, like, redundant. He's, he did the wonderful score for Finding Nemo and the incredible score for Saving Mr. Banks. Those are like his two claims to fame. They are awesome. He's also done a lot of other stuff uh, in his time, and I think it's... But I think that those two are like... The problem is with both those that they sound so dang similar. Mm-hmm. If you go back and l- listen to the Finding Nemo and listen to the Mr. Sa- sorry, Mr. Saving Banks... Saving Mr. Banks <laughs> soundtrack, and they just... They do kind of rattle the same chord, but not in other, like, not in the way of, like, other composers that, again, we will get to later, but also, like, just, it sounds like the same melodies. I don't know. I'm not going to call plagiarism or, like, you know, 
reusing the same word because somebody would have pointed out that pointed that out by now a long time ago. But well, I, I think know, like let's, I mean, let's name some other films. Uh, Skyfall, he did. Uh, oh, did he? I didn't know yes. that. Oh yes, my god, he gosh. did. He did Skyfall. Um, and you know, Newman is just one of those guys. I mean, granted, his name has thankfully been going around thanks to his work in some very well known films. Um, mm-hmm. But I think really he is he is just one of those composers that's a little that's a little better at controlling the string section and creating the ambience that comes with it. Um, I think the only exception to this, in my opinion, is Wally, which he did, um, which I feel kind of embraces more of the curious sound uh, that that you know co- kind of comes from the combination of both of the of both the horns and the strings. But mm-hmm. he's I, – I, I do admit some of his stuff is quite repetitive, and I think you'll listen to Danny Elfman also arguably now in today you – know, you know, in today's time with, with his uh, scoring, it does tend to sound a bit similar because uh, Danny Elfman's a lot less kooky nowadays. He sticks – he's a bit safer. Um, but, yeah. I, I mean, we can't – I don't want to – I don't want to, you know, kind of just, sh- you know uh, – Forget about those guys, you know. Let them ro- roll off my back because there there is a place for them. Just Thomas Newman just isn't one of the more memorable ones as far as melody is concerned. Yeah, but again, like his stuff is really good. I just wish he would branch out a bit. That's all. Yeah, but I, I guess think, I just Skyfall, think he has. He might have just done that. I need to. I need to go back and listen to it. Well, I think he just hasn't really hit his big like melody yet. Once he gets that the melody that everybody remembers, I think then we'll finally get some solid. Stuff. I think, but I think a lot of people remember the scene, the the uh, fire extinguisher scene from Wally, which is uh, hits a lot of heartstrings there. So that got pretty mm-hmm. close. So we'll have to see from uh, what he does in the future. Yeah. All right, Larry, throw out another composer. Let's go. All right, we're sticking on this uh, uh, animation theme because uh, you know he we were talking about Wally by Nemo. Let's go on the uh, let's go on the uh, let's continue on with this uh, Pixar trend. Let's talk about Giacchino. Uh, uh, Michael yes. Michael Giacchino. I was so I'm so hyped for this. This yes. man is the melody master. This guy knows what it's like to create oh. melodies that you just remember always. I, mm-hmm. I, I I love it. I think one of the best, easily one of his best scores is The Incredibles. Uh, yeah, there's like you know there are a lot of he's done a lot of them, but like The Incredibles is like his thesis. It's like that is <laughs> that right there is like. Michael Giacchino. Like, he is so... He understands, like, the tone and pace of a movie so well, and he can incorporate it into, his, into the music so well. Like, that, rare, rarely do you see something like that in, in most, like, film composer, like, lineups. You know, you usually hear great music, and, like, you hear, like, you know, sweeping things, but rarely do you see somebody like Giacchino... I don't know how, if that's how you pronounce his name, I'm sorry. Like, rarely do composers capture the essence of a movie so precisely... No? Oh, most Listen definitely. to the credits of The Incredibles, and there you go. That's oh the my god, I was just about to bring that up. I love The Incredibles, uh, uh, the and the in credits, as he likes to call them. Yeah, uh, that's I right. Think and um, it's a fantastic example of how you can just fully revel in the spy espionage jazz sort of uh, theme that we've seen from so many spy movies and things like that. He just goes all out. In the, throughout the yeah, entire exactly. song, and it's fantastic. <laughs> Other things of note from Giacchino that I think are also important, uh, several of the Pixar movies, Ratatouille, uh, yeah. fantastic. Up, even more so. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. And Cars 2, the movie, terrible. Interesting. The score, I, pretty good. Again, it, it deals yeah. with spy and es- spies and espionage. He's good at that. Uh, other things yeah. of note, uh, Star Trek. Uh, yeah, J. J. Star Trek uh, was Star like my Trek. first exposure to him. Awesome. Like, like there is like he managed. I think, I think maybe you know Trekkies out there. Maybe you might disagree with me, but I think he made a theme that is as memorable as the original theme from the t- television show. Like, yep. just it's it's big, it's it's brash, it's bold, it's huge. It's Star Trek. It's the I scope agree. of Star Trek actually you know managed instead of this weird opera y kind of thing from the TV show, which is fine. Obviously, it's a great it's a great song, but like this one is like. Space, it's awesome. Yeah, pretty, pretty. I think that whole movie is pretty much space is awesome. The movie. Um, yeah. Also, Mission Impossible: Ghost Protocol. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey, you see a theme here, Larry? You see, you see, you see a yeah, theme? Yeah. yeah it's about, Ratatouille, uh, The yeah. Incredibles. Yeah, the one and only Brad Bird, and he is. I believe he's doing. He's composing uh, the score for Tomorrowland. It's out in May. Not just oh, Tomorrowland. He's also doing Inside Out. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. 
This is gonna I be good. I did not know that. Uh, also, Th these Dawn, are candid reactions. Folks. Also, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. That's him. I I didn't know that either. Now See, that score is very thing. unlike him. That that was that's what. That yeah, score it, it is. Not, it is very much so. But like you but, said, it definitely revels in the tone and the theme of the movie. If you just and that give last, it a listen. like, yeah, and that last like shot with the like with the uh, with the with the music is like it's. Seamless. The piano Seems theme. The very there's, last there's shot. very light piano. There's a very light piano theme that goes on there. Oh, brilliant! I love it. Yeah. He's also doing Jurassic Gigi World is, apparently. Yeah. So. And he did the music for Super Eight, which was also very good. Very good. Super Eight, like very much captured the essence of Spielberg's films. Dang it! We're just going to be alluding to it the entire time, aren't we? Anyway, uh, Gigi No is pro also. What? I just want to mention if you listen to this, if you go to the soundtracks of his movies, he always brings puns into everything. And I love it. The in credits, that mm -hmm. every track on the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes soundtrack is a pun. It's a monkey what? pun. I'm totally really? serious. Look it up right now. Each track is some sort of like wordplay or pun. Like how nice. bonobo can you go? Oh my god. Really? Oh yeah. Oh my god. All right, uh, Giugino, you're wonderful. You're puns? Amazing. I, I don't know, man. You're amazing. I don't know. You're, you're, I love but, uh, it. Yeah. Moving along from uh, Giacchino, um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I looked through my imaginary volumes of composers that I enjoy so much, and one of the ones that comes to mind for me is, uh, well, he's a classic. He is widely regarded as one of the most underappreciated composers in the history of filmmaking, and it's because, well, I don't really know why, because he's so good. It is THE Alan Silvestri. Alan Silvestri. This guy. Mm. What a They're, guy. Like, let's see. Let, let, let me tell you. Have you ever heard of Alan Silvestri? No? Um, Back to the Future. Back to the Future. He did, the, he, did the, he did that theme. The theme that you hear every time is a Back to the Future parody, like anywhere ever, which is like all the time these days. Back to the Future. He also did the stuff for Captain America the First Avenger, which was a great soundtrack, and for the Avengers. The Avengers theme? All him, baby. All him. What else, Larry? What else has he done? Uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yes. Fantastic. Cartoony... Uh, sort of score, which I love. I love Eddie's theme. It's by far one of my favorite movie tracks yes. ever. Fantastic. I, you, I actually used Eddie's theme in a video that the three of us did way back in the year of I swear I've probably used it, I've used it in like at least two or three Rule Thirds videos. <laughs> yeah, I we used it, it for, a, for a tribute to, to uh, Roger Ebert when he died. We did. A tribute. And we, yeah, we, and I used Eddie Valens' theme in the, in the background. It's that good. It's like, also, it works. Forrest Gump, we used that yeah. for the Forrest Gump theme we used in our Farewell Channel Hello website video. If you listen mm -hmm. in, you can find that. Um, yeah. Other and you can notice notes. that he does a lot of he does a lot oh. of stuff with um, with uh, Robert Zemeckis. Oh, all I mean, Polar Express. That's a great that's yeah. a great uh, theme. Uh, Cast yeah, Away, like Cast the Away with Robert Zemeckis. Mm -hmm. Fantastic score. Yeah. Do you think he's going to do one for the walk? Do we know that? Is he doing one for... What is it yes, called? The he walk? is. It's confirmed. Awesome. In fact, it is his see, 15th, 15th collaboration with Robert Zemeckis. Wow. That's a like, lot of... See, let me tell you something. Stuff. The biggest disappointment for me coming out of Avengers Age of Ultron right now is the fact that Silvestri is not returning for, this, for the score. Larry, I think you know the guy who's returning, who's doing that score. What's his name? What's his name again? I, I don't know. <laughs> Who is? Brian Tyne. Oh, oh! Hey, segue. Uh, before we before we get yeah, there, though, yeah, that was that was Sylvester, segue. Melody Master, but not only that, he's also just it's it's really epic. He's really good at doing making epic music. Yes, triumphant epic music. He's also good at doing sentimental mm -hmm. music. It's just it's very it's a good mix. Yes. But let's talk about Tyler for a sec, because I, I I am positive none of you know who that is. I. I, I do, and I'm not on, I'm not on the same hype I, train. I you. wouldn't say I'm on a hype train. I, I, I like him. I just I I'm wouldn't not, say I'm on yeah. a hype train. I'm, I, I'm not officially on the hype train yet, but I think it's actually very impressive that he's managed to be involved in such huge projects at such early on, in such a you know an early on phase in his career. He's really young. He was born in '98. Oh Whoa, wait, no, 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 wait, no. Say? He was he began his career in '98. Right. Oh my yeah. god. You yeah. really got me. He's 17. Right. Uh, he began his career in 98. And yet it's it hasn't even been, it's almost maybe it's been less than 10 years. And he's already composing he's already the new pretty much the new composer for all Marvel movies. Some of the, some of the biggest movies yeah. in the world right now. Iron Man 3, that was him. Thor the Dark World, that was him. 
the all hail the king. That was him. Age of Ultron. That's gonna be him. Most likely Civil War. That probably also is gonna be him. And even he even did like he also does stuff outside of there. For example, he did the theme to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie from last year, and it was good. It was a good theme. It was a good soundtrack, and I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's good. I guess. I mean, I didn't listen to the score very much. Well, look, I mean, the theme was like, oh, listen, listen, this guy knows how to do like, I would say, I don't mean to ca- to, to pigeonhole him, but he's kind of like a very masculine oh, yes. composer. And he's, yeah. he's, he's hit the a theme. few, you know, eh, moments, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm not like as on board. I, mean, I think he's good. It's not he like, did I'm not, do you know, the score like for Dragon Ball Evolution, uh, which, um, hmm. I mean, the score wasn't terrible, but the... Uh, Movie was. Yeah, you guys start. Hey, hey, you guys start talking about. Listen, one of the cool things about movies is that maybe the music is like on its own good. Eh. You know? Like it's not, you know. You can't think of any like like legitimately bad. He also did the video. Story, apparently, you know as I research, he did Far Cry Three, the uh, the soundtrack to Far Cry Three, which is a huge, oh. huge thing. He also did it for Black Flag too. So he's 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 hitting some pretty high notes. So I think that this guy's gonna hit a big. Very soon, like even bigger, like a melody people are gonna remember. Also, Iron Man yes. three final battle scene slash ending credit scene is amazing. It is by far one of my favorite mm-hmm. film tracks of all time. I love it to pieces. Just look it up. Uh, it's in fact, it's probably playing behind you yeah. right now. <laughs> uh, Max, go. Let's see. So, Brian Tyler, where do we go from Brian Tyler? We go from a guy who was who started his his career sort of recently, not too recent, to some guys who have only done three scores but have managed to make easily some of the most like excellent uses of ambience in any score i've ever heard trent reznor and atticus ross the oscar-winning composers for the social network the girl with the dragon tattoo Mm. and gone girl oh my god these guys are so good i don't like i don't even know how to describe it they have a very modern very technological and industrial like effect on the films and it's it really helps with their films being very much, I guess, grounded in "quote unquote" reality. So it, it's it, like how it works with you know both the synthesizers and also just like this, this weird moaning like kind of undertone that's like very unsettling. Trent Reznor, I'm not sure about Atticus Ross, but Trent Reznor was part of the band Nine Inch Nails, which did like alternative, alternative music, like the alternative <laughs> music to alternative music. So, so you're saying the alternative, alternative? Yeah, it's like. Yeah, they, I mean, I'm not saying, like, it's screwed up in that it's, like, it's really, like, haunting, not, not like it's bad. Like, it's it's super, like, haunting and weird, and it really helps in a, in a modern setting with, like, something something like The Social Network, which I have a lot of affection for that score. But, and also, I, I really, really connection do. to Elfman. I'm so you mentioned Elfman earlier. He was in the band Oingo Boingo before he started composing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was the front runner. Really? Yeah, and uh, he, wow. he did some great stuff there. And I think that experience adds a lot to the kookiness and sort of zaniness that comes in through a lot of the music that he did too. So clearly we we don't, you know, yeah. you don't have to you can be a part of modern music and you know, bands and stuff and still make great music. Arcade Fire, her, fantastic score. Fantastic ambience music, mm-hmm. just like you're saying. So so there's Atticus and Ross. What else, Larry? Who else can we talk about? You know? Who like there's there's plenty of composers out there, but which ones are we gonna talk about in this span of uh well I mean we're about we have? We're, gonna, we're about to hit some big ones coming up real soon, ones that you clearly have heard of, mm-hmm. ones that are clearly in the modern image. I wanna mention one more before we get there. That's John Debney. A lot of you don't know. Yeah, you just told me about this guy before uh, we started recording. Well, yeah, who but is I, he? Well, I think it's important to know. Uh, you know that little uh, theme we play in the beginning of the show? Uh, run, Llama, Run. Yeah, you yeah. know that? Yeah, that's him. He, uh, he was the man responsible for that theme. That is from one of my favorite films of all time. The em- my favorite film of all time, really. Uh, the Emperor's New Group. Uh, which is yeah, a fantastic score, just jazzy. But not to undermine the rest of the soundtrack, oh, like of the the um, Pacha's theme is yeah beautiful. Oh yeah, it's so like he he can do both wacky zany and also very moving and very like very I don't know why like it just felt very age appropriate, even though music even though classical music doesn't really have like age appropriate like material or or age inappropriate material. You know what I'm saying? Like it's very much like it's very much youthful and childlike, and it works very well. Um, you know. He hasn't really done too many things of note, unfortunately. Um, I mean, the thing about him is a lot of his movies are seen as kind of throwaway. Like, none of them are really classics. Like, I mean, he did Jimmy Neutron. He did Princess Diaries, uh, Bruce Almighty, Elf. 
some of them are classics, but like none of them are like highly revered scores, you know. But like I think just the fact that he's done so many movies that do some people do find very memorable. Um, I think it kind of shows his name a little bit, shows his cred, his street cred. Um, <laughs> and you know, he actually he did the music to Sponge Out of Water, which is a film we recently just oh. uh, reviewed, and it just sort of just goes to show, you know. He does do some pretty good work. I mean, he uh, his scores aren't terrible, and he's done a lot of movies. I think his reach, just how many movies he does, is pretty pretty incredible. Uh, and I hope that you know at some point he he will hit the real big. He'll hit like a big big movie sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. Mm. All right. Yeah. So and so we got uh, we got that out of the way. We have I think three more, Larry. Don't we? Three yep. more composers to talk about. And the first one, I'm going to throw it out there. The first one is one that you might have heard of recently. Because, well, you might have heard of both of them recently. But this guy is a true winner in the literal sense. We're talking about Alexandre Desplat. Is it... This Al- guy... Okay. Is it Alex... I thought it was Alexandre Desplat. I believe it's Desplat. Desplat? I, 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 um, from what I understand, it's, it's funny. I'm going to brag about this. One of my film teachers actually knows uh, Depla and uh, slept on his bed about, or slept on his on the floor of his Paris home about 20 years ago, and wow. that's how he, that, yeah, yeah, that's how he says his name, and so that's how I'm going to do it because right, I got fine. a primary source. I will do that as well. Depla, fantastic yeah. guy, great winner, also much deserved yeah. win for his Academy Award this past year. This this guy has done so much, so much, and he's one of those guys who think that it'll take like. Any job that like any any uh, any composer role that that sounds interesting like he did stuff for Twilight he did and I don't really see that as like a stain or anything because he just like he did it and I- I've never listened to the score so whatever but he did compose one of my favorite pieces of music ever which is Lily's theme from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two which is mm. chilling chilling Good this guy him. just won an Oscar for the Grand Prix Best Hotel deservedly this guy is awesome I believe he's worked with um, Wes Anderson in the past too like he's I think. Dave Pla looks at like the undertones of not the film itself, but the people who make it, and, the, and like and the, what they're trying to go for. And he's like, okay, instead of going for the, like the final product, I'm just gonna go for what like you know, like Grand Budapest is Wes Anderson. Like it's oh, Andersonian all over the place. It's Wes Anderson. I've I've, yeah. I've listened to that entire score, um, just because I, I've used it to edit. Uh, it's crazy, Wes Anderson. It's quirky all over the place. Just the the varied instrumentation he uses. Uh, with especially that mandolin theme during the credits, it's so Anderson. You can just this like y- he also did Moonrise Kingdom with Anderson. You can tell that they that he trusts him incredibly. Yeah, he's um like yeah he's he's very good, and I was really glad to see that his uh, that his work was finally paid off with that Golden Idol. And yeah, he's he's really like he really is just like awesome. Like he's kind of ubiquitous, you know. Like, just how many, like, you can, you, we're both, okay, both of us, I'm gonna pull back the curtain a bit, both of us are looking at, like, the, um, my god, he did, like, a bajillion scores in 2010, and then again in 2011. We're, we're both looking at, like, the filmographies just to find out, like, which one's exactly, like, Zero Dark Thirty, Argo, like, the even even smaller stuff, like Philomena, Phil, Philom, Philomena, yeah, did, Philomena, yeah, Unbroken, Godzilla, he does a lot of, like, Oscar stuff, he's, uh, uh he was see, nominated twice. <laughs> yeah, for both uh, the Speech. Grand Budapest and the Imitation Game, but twice in one year, that's pretty yeah. impressive, uh, I'd say. Tree of Life, whose whose score was really really awesome, and, very, and very, I think a lot of you probably recognize his name because he was recently announced to uh, as the confirmed composer for Star Wars Rogue One, the uh, the yeah. spinoff film for Episode Seven. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are upset that that other guy isn't composing it. But I, I, fe- yeah. I think it's I think it's important to address that I have complete faith in Depla that he's gonna knock Absolutely. it out of the park. I have no mm-hmm. no worries. Like like literally this when I first was like, oh man, that's, this is this is terrible. I'm like, what are you talking about? What is what what what? This guy's on like a career surge, or not, not a surge, but like he's on he's like a, on a victory lap. So yeah, we uh, we don't have to worry about. Rogue One. I think that soundtrack is going to be just fine. But yeah. um, also at the Oscars, who was nominated but lost, Larry, who was that person? Uh, well, uh, he's, a, he's a little guy. Yeah, I don't know if you, I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, his name is uh, Hans Z- Zimmer. 
Z- Z- Zimmer? Hans Zimmer? Hans Zimmer? Hans Hans, Hans Hans Zimmer. Yeah, I don't know. His name's come up a few times. You know. A few. Yeah, like try like a lot. Hans Zimmer's one of my fa- <laughs> Hans Zimmer's one of my favorite composers. Um mm-hmm. uh, let, let's just let's just let's just drop some names. Uh Lion King. Uh yep. Dark Knight. Um Interstellar. Uh, Twelve Years a Slave, uh, Man of Steel, terrible Which, movie. Say Granted. what? Uh, would you give it a rest? Say what you will about the movie. The the like Superman's theme, which is I think very lo- which the theme in the soundtrack is very long. For me, in fact, like, Hans Zimmer has so much to his name. His discography has an entire Wikipedia page dedicated yeah. to it. That is mm-hmm. that that is something. Let me tell you. Yeah, everything from like, and also you know stuff like Inception and Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, of course. And like, how? C- yeah. I was just about to say, my, one of my favorite film scores of all time, Pirates mm-hmm. of the Caribbean. The first one specifically. I think the rest of the the rest of them are good, but oh man, the the the, the theme to Pirates of the Caribbean is by far one of my favorite pieces of music ever. So good. Uh, he also has done. I mean, he's done a lot of stuff. He did the Sherlock Holmes films. Um, he's done some work for DreamWorks, Madagascar, Kung Fu Panda, um, Megamind. He's just done a lot of interesting work. And I think a lot of people like to argue that his work has become a little stale uh, just because we, we need some new talent. But Sean brought it up that Interstellar sounds a little different. So I decided to listen to it, and he's right. I think I think uh, Interstellar does sound quite different as you know in comparison to various It, it sounds Zimmer like 2001 A Space Odyssey. Real talk. It sounds like 2001. As well, that's, well, that's okay. fine. That's, that's sort fine. of. I think that's pretty justified. As to, because I think both films deal with a very similar idea. Yeah. See, all right. And here's before we move on. Before we move on, I have, a, I have an interesting tidbit for you, Larry. And you might know this already. I don't know, but I just heard about this. So Hans Zimmer composed the the, uh, the theme for Man of Steel, right? Correct. And we're going to be seeing Superman again soon. Mm-hmm. But here's what's interesting. For Batman, for the new Batman, the one that's after, you know, that's not, whose theme is not composed by Hans Zimmer, it's actually going to be composed by a different name, Junkie XL. You, do you know Junkie XL? No. He's not really, well. yeah, he's not really that well known, like, to the point where we talk about him on this podcast, but he was responsible for a few soundtracks, uh, no, most notably 300 Rise of an Empire, which was ah, good. That yeah, was good score. Okay, good, and good soundtrack. And what they're going to do is... When, you know, in the next movie, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, they're actually, as Superman and Batman fight, it's going to be a battle of the themes. On Zimmer's Man of Steel theme is going to go in there, and Junkie XL's Batman theme, whatever that is, will go in, and, like, it will literally be at conflict with each other in the movie. Like, you will hear it, yeah, which I think is brilliant, and just kind of a testament to what this guy can do, especially in collaboration. I think that's going to be a really, really cool, like, like, audible part of that movie. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how it sounds. It could be a massive failure. It could, but let's hope that it's not. Yeah. But Larry, let's pray. We've been talking. Yeah. <laughs> I I have hope in it. I have hope in it. But Larry, we're talking about all these composers, but there's somebody that we've been we've been alluding to. Somebody that we've been missing, and it's, and it's because he is the king. Like I, there's really no other way to put it. He is the king He's of the film king. scores. He's the king. Like there's no other person out there that even he. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he is the most nominated person on the planet for the for an Academy Award. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only John Williams. Wonderful. John. John Williams. Is yeah. John, like, John Williams. We could do several podcasts on John Williams' work. He's done so much. I don't even need to look at a Wikipedia article for this stuff. Like this, He's done stuff for everything from Star Wars, from like every Spielberg movie, the E.T. theme, Home Alone. And then he would come back and do the first three films in the Harry Potter series, which I would regard as almost his best work. Like, seriously, go back and listen to that. Fox the Phoenix, y'all. John best. Williams? Harry Potter is his best work? Uh, I'd say it's up there. Not, are, not, are, the, not, are, not Hedwig's are, theme, are, but most I, of it. I, I, most. I, 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 yes, I, I'm saying, I'm making statements. Superman, Star Wars is up there. Indiana Jones. Those are, uh, oh my god, those themes. Jaws. Yes, they're, they're amazing, Park. they're amazing. Jurassic Park is by far my favorite John Williams thing ever. I love the Jurassic Park theme. I think just the way it swells and moves is just brilliant. But yes, the Harry Potter theme is great. No, I'm not. I'm not talking about the themes. I'm talking about the entire soundtrack. The entire well, yeah, scores. I think most of the Harry Potter movies are theme. some of his best work. 
I think the theme is probably the most memorable thing it's got. Uh, I would I would argue that Hedwig's theme is up there, but it's there are other ones. I've been on a Harry Potter kick recently, so I've really been like listening to the soundtracks and hearing it. Also, shout outs to um, Patrick Doyle, Nicholas Hooper, and you know, and Dave Pla, who all composed stuff after that. But like Williams, like if you go back and listen to Harry Potter scores, it's it's amazing how many different melodies he can create out of like an emotional moment or like one character. Like there, there are guys who make themes for entire movies or characters, but there's no, there's no way that you can take a moment from a movie and turn it into something swooping, something breathing, alive, something that you can remember when you walk out of the theater. John Williams is the man. He is easily my favorite composer, and like I, you know, I'm gonna make that statement, and I don't think there's anybody else who's gonna really disagree with me on that. Is, is, is he yours, Larry? Hmm. I would say I guess yes, because <laughs> you know. Duh. Um, but yes. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that his talent goes like un. What's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's not like he reigns utterly like supreme, and everyone else around him just basks in his only glory. I yes, think, yes, I think there are several composers. Yeah, he's up there, but I think several composers have created themes that do match. You know, his. I think the reason that Williams is so well known is because of just the succession of his work. His 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 big like his <laughs> like his huge moment like the the top of the hill lasted for years and I think there's a lot to say about that uh, but I mean mm-hmm. you have to keep in mind some of the other people that we've been mentioning here um, yeah like, I mean I would I would say that G H I, I don't mean to like shoe, shoe hole uh, pigeonhole him as I seem to be pigeonholing a lot of people today um, I don't mean to pigeonhole Giacchino but I do think he's the closest to like a next generation John Williams. I think. I would say Just, so. I think Sylvester also comes pretty close. Yes, Sylvester is so close. I mean, we're He's dealing like, with, I mean, like, let's think about this for a sec. The Back to the Future theme is by far one of the best film score, one of the best film themes of all time. That and, like, rivals. the entire score is incredible. Like, yeah, make no mistake. We're not, that, you know, I, don't, I, know. I, I love themes, but the scores, like, the entireties is... Yeah. Right, but I, I will argue that that one theme is the most memorable part of the entire score. And not only that, it does rival some of Williams' best stuff. I'd also argue up, the theme from up, like in towards the beginning, that also mm-hmm. rivals William stuff and just how how polished and how great it sounds. But I mean, yeah, dude, it's just like it's just, he, bro, Superman, E.T., Jurassic Park, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, all these amazing themes that none of us don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know what's interesting? Here's here's how awesome John Williams is. If in case you were unaware, John Williams is so good. He is. He managed to take the much reviled prequels and give Star Wars prequels and give them amazing music. The Star Wars movies have consistently incredible music. Like it's it's not it's like it's not even funny. It's like you, know, you can you can bash the prequels all they want, but the music is so on point and so excellent. The love theme, like the the, the duel of the fates, if you want to go there, which is it, like yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, I'd go there. Eh, duel of fates is eh, but like I'm everything else, fates. amazing. Just. I mean, again, this podcast has been mostly us just, like, gushing over stuff, and I know it's not, like, too much, you know, film enough or whatever, but, like, it's, it really uh, is just... Oh, yo, okay, film music is incredibly important. I feel that no, the No, no, it is, it is, but, like, them. we've been doing nothing but just been, like, I know, this guy's people, awesome because... The people who create then, yeah. the music deserve to be appreciated in complete yeah, absolutely, regard absolutely. for what they do. What I'm saying is that we haven't been exactly analytical. We've just been, like, this guy's awesome! Fair analytical. Fair. I don't mind. I'm totally down with just talking about composers. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Do you have, like, do you, is there, uh, I can tell you right now, is there, like, a, a piece of music that, like, sent, like, every time you hear it, you send, it sends chills down your entire body, just everywhere. I can tell you mine. I can tell you two right off the bat. Uh, well, the Back to the Future theme, uh, mm-hmm. immediately. Pirates of the Caribbean, easily. Um, just, well, a lot. I mean, the, the Iron Man theme. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I can't really think of any others though. I mean that that like I mean I mean besides for the obvious ones, but I think those ones go a little bit at, more unnoticed as opposed. Well, what about you? Um, let's see. Well, I'm actually a, I'm a big fan of like climb of like finales, and two ones that come to mind are from John Williams. The first one is the end credits. This is kind of very specific. The end end credits to Return of the Jedi. The very end. It's like this amazing climactic finish. It's like the end. 
It's you, you. It's like one of the best rewards for staying through the credits ever. Like even better than a post credit scene. It's just this amazing. Like bam, it's done. The other one is the finale from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, which is actually played at the very end of the theme. It's like, oh my god, I hear it. It's it's so. It's such a boisterous, huge ending. It's like awesome. And you know, there are other ones I like think of where that come to mind, but like nothing, nothing tops Williams for me. Like I, I know it's generic, and I know some people have some problems with him or whatever. But like, there's he. For me, he takes the cake. And for most films, like, most film composers, they, they're kind of like, they're kind of like on their own, you know? They, they're not like, oh, you know, the director does this, and the producer, they, the director, like, the composer's like, not on his own, like, physically, like, he's got, like, a lot of people around him, but, or, or them, that mean. You know what I mean? But, um, like, the, the composer, like, if they can nail it, even a terrible movie can have a great score. And that's, that's kind of the power of music. It can still it can still sound great while still being terrible. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I think a score like there, is is it's so hard to find a movie with a bad score. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It's like it just sounds like the the weakest scores out there are the ones that just sound super generic and like you know it's like whatever. So okay, um, let's see, Larry. Do, do we have anything to end this off with? Like anything? Like just just any last words on these on the composers? Honorable mentions, really uh, quickly. Okay. I, okay. Uh, Henry Jackman, X Men okay, First Class, that's good. Captain America, Winter Soldier, Big Hero Six, Captain Phillips, fantastic. Really good at just seizing the moment whenever he can. Mm-hmm. Um, John Powell, I mention him specifically because Shrek, uh, Ice Age, Had to Train Your Dragon, fun scores. Uh, he's mainly in, he's really big into animated movies, and I kind of find that admirable that he likes to post for those one that i think we should have talked about but i mean it's granted why we didn't uh elmer bernstein huge guy the magnificent seven the ten commandments the great escape oh, ghostbusters oh boy. to kill a mockingbird oh airplane huge okay i think it's that worth it feel i mean the magnificent seven is a great piece of music also great mm-hmm. film score uh but those are just three i think that we should that we should mention fantastic yeah yeah let's see i think there's there's one other. There's one other that I had in mind. I thought was like excellent for this. Now I can't remember, and now I'm wasting time. This podcast, unless I can think of it right now. No, I can't. Um, yeah, that like if you're if you're I I admire all the film composers out there. Like I personally believe that John Williams is a wizard. It's not telling anybody, but like <laughs> involved in all like in all seriousness, if you are out there and you're composing music for a film, you are awesome. And you, you are helping out with the with, that does not to sound grandiose here, but the cinematic experience. Music is a huge, huge part of it. And as as long as we have great composers out there like John Williams, like Dave Pla, like Giacchino, like all the ones that we've talked about today, I think films are like, I think films will have a certain magic to them. Then we're gonna be okay. You know what? Then, you know another thing. I am currently working on a project where I am like scoring a video, like a piece of music. Huh. Timing and stuff is really hard to like yeah. time music to emotional moments and to yet still have coherent music attached to them and to still create themes that are great. Film composers, in my opinion, to compose for a film is one of the hardest jobs you could ever have. Not just yeah. in the film industry, any any industry ever. It's incredibly challenging. It requires. How the hell are you supposed to turn something emotional into like a a, a piece of music into like exactly. a string or or a blat on the trumpet? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. How do you do that? It's like it's it takes it takes like a skill set, and then it takes a skill set a a skill set on top of that skill set. A skillet, it, yes. It takes a skillet to yeah. It takes a skillet, and like as, especially like I my one dream in life, like my if like I would like to do this before I die, is to have directed uh and yeah i guess written maybe and score a movie like if i can do all three of those things for a movie whether it's a short film or a feature or whatever it is my life will thus be complete like that is i love film music i love composing music whenever i get the chance uh and film music is a lot of it it's a big inspiration a lot of themes People like Silvestri, um, Giacchino, Williams, and Bernstein even with uh, with the uh, Magnificent Seven. Those themes really inspire me when I write. 
Whenever I think about what I want to, what, where, what tone I'm trying to set or what mood I'm trying to think about, I think of other melodies and how I can sort of mishmash them and combine them and sort of work with them and take the, take the techniques that they've used and apply it to my own. I admire them quite a bit, and it is so, film music is always something that I will hold very dearly, right next to my heart, right here. Yeah, right, that's right here. great way, to pl- uh, great way to uh, end it. Um, so again, uh, if you forgot at the beginning. I'll ask again. What is your favorite? Who is your favorite composer, and what is your favorite piece from them? I want to know. I want to know. I, I kind of I want to say mine, but I want to also save it for a different thing that might be in the future. <laughs> ah, but uh, yeah, but um, yeah. I think I think we've had a good time gushing. Now, now I'm gonna go actually listen to all this music. What do you say, Larry? I, I, I'm gonna go do that. You're gonna go do that. I already have the Pirates of the Caribbean theme on my phone. I'm gonna I'm gonna whip I'm gonna whip that up. Yeah. All right. So um, until next week, guys. My name is Max. My name is Larry. Thanks for listening. Play us out, Mr. Williams. <laughs>